So welcome to everybody to our online seminar. It's wonderful to have so many people here. And uh, you can see for the next three weeks, we've scheduled Alina Bodiva, Scott Aronson, and Sean Cooey. And today we have the wonderful uh, occasion to have Werner Nam jointly having this seminar with the Dublin Institute for Advanced Study. I'd like to pass it over to Don Joy O'Connor, who's the director of the School of Theoretical Physics in Dublin, and let him talk about Werner. Don Joy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Werner Nam, a senior professor. Um, Werner is, of course, known for his groundbreaking work on uh, supergroups, d equals 11 supergravity, NAM equations, conformal field theory, more recently, the history of science. Um, if you were joining me from the humanities, of course, I would have to tell you that uh, Werner Nam is the famous Assyriologist who uh, uh, is known for his uh, work on the lower middle chronology. He is also well known for his work on Mayan studies. Uh, and more recently, his work uh, in Ireland on the Ohm project, which is uh, 3D imaging of uh, uh, Ohm stones, which have some old uh, writing on them. Um, he is a fellow of the Royal Society, a Max Planck uh, medalist, a Lisa Meitner uh, prize winner, and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Werner. Arthur will tell you more than I have told. There's hardly anything more I can say, so I think we <laughs> should hear from Werner. Okay. Well, uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. And uh, of course, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, for me uh, to talk to you all. Uh, please interrupt me anytime because uh, well, when, when you talk about axioms, then uh, the, the details are important and you tend to overlook uh, important details yourself. So uh, I hope you can help me with that. So, okay. Um, the topic will be Euclidean quantum field theory. Uh, I've seen that Klaus Fredenhagen is in the audience. Uh, so. Uh, I have really not much of an idea how uh, to, uh, to de best describe uh, quantum field theory uh, in curved uh, pseudo Riemannian space. But maybe we can talk about that later. So, okay, that's too, uh, my problems go back. Uh, bit more than 40 years uh, when uh, Don Zagier, when we first met, asked me what is quantum field theory and uh, what is a field and uh, I couldn't answer. Then it got a bit more productive uh, when uh, he asked about modular forms and gave me a course on modular forms and, and all that. So, of course, I, I started to talk about quantum field theory the, the way I'd learned it in textbooks, uh, which uh, turned out to be completely unsuitable uh, for a mathematician. In recent time, uh, things have changed a bit. Uh, even Don has started to lecture about vertex operator algebra. The problem with vertex operator algebra is firstly, they, they are very special, very special uh, only uh, relating uh, to conformally covariant quantum field theory. And then the axioms are definitely not memorable. When you are interested in an axiom of quantum field theory, then you probably uh, remember uh, PCD, spin and statistics, and all that, uh, which was modeled on a book by British historians who found out by asking random people at a cricket match uh, that most dates of British history were not memorable. On the other hand, uh, group theory axioms and all that is very memorable. And uh, we sh uh, here's an attempt uh, to do something similar for uh, Euclidean quantum field theory. So uh, first thing 
the, the one thing which is easy to understand is the partition function. We are in, in a fixed dimension of, uh, and in the space with a Riemannian metric. Should be compact. Uh, one of the problems with uh, Minkowski and case is uh, non-compact situations are always more difficult. And so partition function is a map uh, from the set of manifolds with Riemannian metrics up to isomorphism, of course, that will be important later. And uh, so you can define the theory of a free scalar field of mass m uh, just by saying uh, that the partition function is a uh, determinant of the corresponding Laplace operator to the appropriate power. Now, that's a determinant, of course, of an infinite uh, operator in infinite dimensions, but that doesn't matter. Uh, use zeta function regularization. Every mathematician knows that. So uh, then you can immediately give interesting, uh, further interesting examples, uh, in particular from uh, conformal field theory. So in the simplest model, to five minimal model, uh, the- Berger, uh, are you planning to share your screen at some point? Oh, uh, I thought you, uh, I had scared, uh, uh, I had done that already. So then uh, let me start again. Uh, do you see it, see, see it now? No. Werner, we see it, yeah, thank you. Okay, so let me go back. So the, the questions are, what is quantum field theory? What is a field and how do automorphic forms uh, come into play? Okay, so uh, the, the way uh, to talk about a Euclidean quantum field theory, uh, in my opinion, is to talk about the partition function and that's all you need to know. So uh, when you have a, a free scalar of mass m, you have this, this formula for the partition function uh, given by a determinant of the Laplacian. And that's all, uh, everything else can be derived from that. If you admit arbitrary Riemannian metrics. So again, let me say I, I have a space of, uh, well, a set of compact d-dimensional manifolds with Riemannian metric up to isomorphisms. So when you have that, uh, then for example, you get the energy momentum tensor by taking a variation with respect to the metric. So another example, the two five minimal model, uh, I write it for, well, it, it's easy to write it down for genus zero, but here is, it's a bit more interesting for genus one. They have one obvious geometric factor. When you have a torus, it's a complex curve and you have a holomorphic differential dz. And in terms of that differential, you have a metric Hermitian metric is that is that bar times some factor, so that's the chi, and then uh, you have a Gauss curvature, so that's a simple geometric factor, and the rest is Rogers Ramanujan modular functions. So uh, it uh, immediately involves uh, objects uh, which are dear uh, to many mathematicians. And uh, okay. Everything only should uh, depend on, on the modulus. Uh, so here, these are modular functions, not modular forms. Modular forms uh, come into play because uh, when you relate it to the determinant we had before, the determinant of the Laplace operator uh, in two dimensions, taken out the zero mode, uh, is given by the eta, famous eta modular form. Uh, the whole thing is invariant because it's multiplied by the imaginary part of tau, which has a simple transformation property. So without further ado, 
here are my axioms for the partition function of Euclidean quantum field theory. Firstly, uh, they must be multiplicative on this joint union. They must be smooth and uh, the derivatives must have bounded branching. Uh, we'll talk about that later. That's the, the only new thing. Um, and to see how the axioms work together after introducing each axiom in, in turn in, in more detail, uh, I discuss it uh, for the case of d equal one, not of physical interest, but uh, it shows you how uh, the, the mathematics works out. Also, again, that was advice for Don Zaghi, uh, don't attempt uh, to, to get uh, the axiom right uh, immediately. Uh, firstly, uh, don't care if you demand uh, too much. One uh, always can drop things and uh, one always might uh, change a word or two. Uh, for example, when I go back, uh, the set of Riemannian metrics, what precisely does one demand uh, for Riemannian metric? Well, uh, G should certainly be continuous, but uh, it's probably sufficient uh, to have it piecewise smooth, uh, which uh, would give you more flexibility. And uh, for the mathematics notation, uh, what I need, that's uh, for, for any set S, I need a very big vector space uh, with one basis element uh, for each element of the set. And the basic element that, that's standard, uh, you, you write uh, in square brackets. So uh, we will have to scale the elements S for to define derivatives, uh, but uh, when you do it in the inside of the square bracket, it uh, just gives you another basis element, it has nothing to do uh, with multiplication uh, on the outside. I have a real vector space, so epsilon can, can be any real number and any basis element can be multi multiplied uh, with, with any real number, just for notation. So first axiom, very simple, partition function on a disjoint union is the product of the partition function of the factors. So for d equal one, it's easy. There are not many one dimensional manifolds uh, with Riemann metric, uh, just given by the length. So uh, z, uh, uh, because of, of that axiom, z is determined by its values on circles of circumference L. So the, the second axiom for d equal one just should state uh, that the partition function is a smooth function of L. But uh, how to do it for higher dimensions uh, where you have infinite dimensional spaces and uh, the more, the, the standard way is to do functional derivatives and at least for pedagogic reasons, uh, I will have my formalism for that too. That's uh, uh, because the, the space of metrics is, is locally affine. Uh, you, you can add some perturbation and you can scale the perturbation. So uh, that, that kind of derivative uh, has been defined since a long time, but uh, I will need a new derivative uh, which is more adapted uh, to what goes on in, in quantum field theory, where you can change the manifold in small regions, which you can scale uh, to zero. And I think that uh, it would be sufficient uh, to use only derivatives of the second kind, but uh, they are a bit harder to visualize because they can change the, the topology. So uh, to be on the safe side, at least for the moment, uh, let's require that Z is smooth with respect to both derivatives. So smooth means that arbitrary 
derivatives act on the partition function. So uh, it's, uh, well, normally derivatives are uh, defined uh, iteratively. You start with derivatives of first order or so. Uh, here it's more useful to define that all at once. So in the simplest case, uh, when you just have a function on R and you want to have a, a second derivative, uh, then you take the limit uh, of uh, such a combination scaled with epsilon to the minus two. So uh, what you need are, are shifts here by minus epsilon, here by plus epsilon, here by zero, and numbers, well, integers or, well, I, you, you can admit uh, arbitrary real numbers. And uh, this way can be generalized uh, to, to uh, infinite dimension spaces. So assume that, that A is an, is an affine space and you have uh, V as a set of vectors in this affine space. So when you use every vector as a basis element, then you can form formal linear combinations, finite sums. So here's a vector, here's just a real number and a finite sum. And uh, so you shift your argument by a vector, you rescale the vector, uh, you take a sum with coefficients AI, and uh, then uh, depending on, on what you have chosen, uh, the, the whole thing uh, will go to zero like some power of epsilon. And you multiply with epsilon to the minus k and, and take the limit. So that gives you the standard derivatives. And uh, that concept works in, in arbitrary affine spaces. So when we have some set f of, of functions with domain A, we say that, that this set is smooth when arbitrary derivatives uh, are defined on it, uh, that uh, for, for any linear combination of that kind, for, for any formal linear combination, there is some number k such that the limit exists and is generically not zero. Of course, it, it only can be one number. Um, if you take it too small, then you get zero. If you take it too high, then, then you get infinity. So uh, in the quantum field theory case, in, instead of k, uh, you, you will have a scaling dimension, which uh, can take on uh, uh, real values, not just, just integral values. Eventually, uh, but I'm not quite sure about that, uh, uh, you, you might admit logarithms, uh, then you would have more invariance of a derivative than just the order. For the moment, uh, the only thing you say about the derivative is what is the order. In any case, what, what I've done here is, uh, well, uh, the, the ordinary thing for, for finite dimension uh, spaces, uh, also for, for, for manifolds, it's just a standard, but it's a, an appropriate formalism in the infinite dimensional case. So part A of my smoothness axioms is that the partition function uh, should admit arbitrary, uh, arbitrary derivatives uh, based on the affine behavior of metrics. And for part B, as I've said, you, you want to change the manifold uh, only locally. And you can do that by cutting and gluing. So let B be the set of manifolds with Riemannian metrics that have the unit sphere in RD as boundary. Scale it by some small number, small positive real number. So you get uh, something inside a sphere with radius epsilon. And uh, at any point of your manifold, cut out a small sphere with that radius and clue in uh, the, the boundary B. 
So um, there are various ways uh, you, you can uh, define uh, the gluing in, in detail. Uh, one thing you need uh, is a frame, so you know how to orient to your sphere. And then uh, you could think about various ways uh, to smooth out uh, the, the boundary. Uh, just choose one particular way, it shouldn't matter for the result. But one such way should be chosen. So let's, let's call the result uh, when you have a, a manifold with boundary little b, scale it with epsilon, and clue it in at a place x. So then take arbitrary linear combinations, uh, the way we had it before, and define a local derivative by such a limit. Just same thing before and with similar properties. Now, uh, that can easily be generalized uh, if uh, your bounded manifold has more uh, than one boundary components. Uh, each one uh, should be identified uh, with uh, the unit sphere in RD. So for each one, some isomorphism uh, should be given. And uh, then when you have n distinct points, uh, you just scale your boundary manifold by some sufficiently small epsilon and uh, you clue it in, you clue the boundary in at these distinct points. Now, unfortunately, uh, there is, there doesn't seem to be a short word uh, for number of boundary components of a manifold. Uh, so I, I call it branching. If you have a, a better word, uh, then please tell me. Branching is, uh, says a bit too much because uh, a tree can branch in, in various places and I need uh, just the, the number of branches, nothing, nothing else, but I couldn't think of a, of a better word. So part B of my, my second axiom is that uh, the partition function is smooth uh, with respect to all these derivatives. Now, uh, for d equal 1, it doesn't really matter if you have an, an affine uh, derivative or a, a, a branching 1 derivative. Uh, uh, when you change the metric, then uh, you, well, if you increase the, the metric, uh, then you blow up uh, the, the circle uh, at, uh, at every point. Uh, if you just glue in uh, a little new stretch, uh, then you increase the length uh, just at, at one point, but uh, uh, the results are isomorphic, so it, it doesn't matter. But uh, the boundary derivative uh, does more. If you have two manifolds, uh, then you, uh, and you have uh, two boundary components, then you can clue the two manifolds together. So uh, for the, the dimension one case, uh, uh, well, the, the, the only element really in, uh, uh, in B2 is uh, two line segments and uh, a pair of endpoints uh, is defined to be a boundary. And then you clue it in and uh, then you get a new uh, derivative, if you only have one term here, then you have a derivative of order zero. And uh, when you have a, a partition function and you evaluate it at, at two lengths, it's just uh, the partition function on, on a single circle of lengths, L1 plus L2. So the third axiom, well, firstly, when, when you have a dis uh, when uh, you take disjoint unions and you have two boundary manifolds with m and n boundary components, then you get a manifold with m plus or n boundary components. So when you take linear combinations, you get a bilinear map on that case. And uh, when when you take a derivative 
with respect uh, to a disjoint union, then of course uh, you, you can do the, the, the two things separately. When you, when you change a manifold uh, at, at two pl places in independent ways, uh, then well, that's, that's just uh, one branch for, for each point. And the third axiom states uh, that there is a natural number uh, such that you don't have to consider too many branches. Uh, uh, when you have more than n holes, uh, then everything can be written bilinearly uh, in terms of derivatives of, of lesser branching. So apply that uh, to d equal one. And uh, first for, for branching one, then you require that uh, z for the sum of two lengths can be written as a bilinear, finite bilinear expression in terms of z and its derivatives at L1 and z and its derivatives at L2. And that means that z satisfies a linear ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. So it's an elementary function, um, polynomial or uh, exponential or, or sum of exponentials and, and, and nothing else. So uh, in, in that case, uh, d equal one, you see how the, the three axioms uh, work together. First axioms, uh, you just need a function of one variable. Uh, second axiom, the function must be smooth. And third axiom uh, that uh, you get an elementary function because you get your, your linear ODE. And uh, well, when you have a linear ODE, it depends on the order. Uh, when you have a higher order, then you have more coefficients. And uh, so the, when in that sense, uh, the, the objects which, which satisfy the, the axioms for d equal one uh, come in, in different strata uh, with different number of parameters, uh, but each stratum has a finite number of parameters. And that's what we would expect for quantum field theory, Euclidean quantum field theory in particular. So now when you have a partition function which satisfies uh, the three axioms, then the, the axioms immediately provide you with a lot of fields because uh, each B type derivative defines a field of the theory. If it's in Bn, then it's a, a multi local field. And uh, the, the value on Z is the corresponding endpoint function. So, of course, one would have uh, to specify frames. Uh, at the endpoints, that's, that's standard in, in quantum field theory. I will not talk about the frames anymore. Uh, in two, uh, two dimensions, uh, when you have a complex structure, then the, the complex structure, of course, uh, already gives you a frame because you have a real direction and an imaginary direction. So, it's, it seems to be an appropriate setting for quantum field theory, if you want uh, to uh, write down an endpoint function uh, just for, for local fields, then, uh, well, uh, take the, the corresponding disjoint union and apply it uh, to the partition function. You can do that uh, to the determinant uh, describing a free scalar field. And uh, you get all the stuff uh, you have in, in the first 20 pages of, of standard textbooks of quantum field theory. But of course, the standard uh, textbooks uh, do it only for Euclid flat uh, Euclidean space. And uh, you don't have uh, the liberty of uh, taking derivatives with respect uh, to, to the metric. By the way, I think uh, that's the, the minimum uh, we have learned uh, from string theory that 
quantum fields and gravity should not occupy uh, different parts of our minds. Uh, in, in nature, they work together. And uh, so also in, in the mathematics uh, we develop uh, for quantum field theories, uh, they, they should work together. And uh, well, it, it was Einstein uh, who described uh, the energy momentum tensor as derivative uh, with respect uh, to the space-time metric. And that was a, a very deep insight. And he, he had that for, for classical field theory but uh, you can do it equally well for uh, quantum fields. Okay, so uh, I uh, go to some subtleties of the definition before. Firstly, uh, derivatives had an order that was uh, the, the number Bernard, k. there's a question about yep. uh, fractional derivatives. Yes. Um, I, I will give an example where a fractional derivative uh, turns up. Um, here, of course, in, in, in the affine case, uh, you don't expect them. So uh, here uh, you, you expect integers. And uh, of course, uh, when your sum only contains one term, so you consider x plus, plus epsilon v with one single vector, and of course, it has a limit when uh, epsilon goes to zero. So when you have a, a single vector here, then you get a derivative of order zero, uh, which is just a, a multiple. Or if you put uh, a equal to one, uh, then it's just the identity operator. So uh, when you have uh, a difference, uh, then uh, you would get a, a derivative of, of order one and uh, similar for, for higher terms. But uh, I'll show you later uh, in, in, the in the concrete example of the 2-5 uh, conformal field theory that the boundary derivatives uh, can have essentially arbitrary order. So, okay. Uh, the one thing, the one theory where I think that my axioms fail is uh, the, the free scalar field in, in two dimensions because you get infinitely many fields of scaling dimension zero. And uh, then the, the derivative concept. Uh, runs in, in uh, to problems. But we know anyhow that uh, for mass zero, uh, the free scalar theory in two dimensions does not exist. And uh, I assume that uh, most of the quantum field theories we are interested in, and certainly all the Euclidean quantum field theories which appear in, in solid state physics uh, would satisfy uh, the, the axioms I've written down. But uh, there's something interesting about uh, scalar fields uh, to be said here. The fields I've constructed are things like, like the energy momentum tensor, uh, which is bilinear in phi, and I can't possibly construct uh, the scalar field phi itself, which satisfies uh, this equation. Uh, because uh, the, the equation is invariant on a uh, sign change of phi. So I only can construct uh, from geometry, I only can construct fields which are even under this uh, sign change. So uh, uh, in a way there is, the, the, uh, super selection sectors, and, and Klaus Fredenhagen has uh, written a lot about that. And uh, I assume uh, that already at, at the level here, uh, similar things appear. Uh, it comes in uh, immediately when you try uh, to factorize uh, by local fields. So if you have a, a product of uh, the 
scalar field at, at two different positions, uh, then it can be written as a bilocal derivative uh, because it's even under the involution, but it cannot be factorized. However, uh, there certainly is a way uh, to introduce supplementary objects, maybe also to be called fields, uh, for which uh, such a factorization, a factorization is, is possible. And uh, then after introducing them, uh, maybe you uh, don't have uh, to talk about uh, multilocal fields anymore. You can write everything uh, which is multilocal uh, in terms of ordinary local fields. So another simple example. Well, when you multiply uh, two partition functions satisfying the axioms, then you get a new partition function satisfying the axioms. And in most cases, uh, the fields of both can be recovered uh, as derivatives in, in, in the way I uh, described it. Uh, but uh, when you have the nth power of a partition function, then all the, uh, the, the fields are invariant on the permutations of the factors because uh, the, well, changing, changing the metric uh, affects them all at once. So when, when you look at, at all the fields of the original theory, they are permuted when you permute uh, the factors and the only fields you, you, you get uh, from uh, the, the boundary derivatives are the, the ones which are invariant under the permutation group. But certainly you can introduce supplementary fields, uh, only fields which are, uh, uh, which transform non-trivially under the permutation group. Uh, so in particular, the, the one point functions are zero. But in, in this way, uh, you, you can, hope uh, to recover a branching one theory. And in, in the case of algebraic quantum field theory uh, that has been studied a lot uh, in terms of, of tanaka Krein uh, duality and all that, I, I think I, I will have to, to read all the, these papers and uh, uh, Klaus Friedenshagen's uh, uh, notes and, and so on. And, then probably, uh, well, I, I would hope that one uh, can prove similar results here that the situation is generic, that when you start with, with some quantum field theory, then uh, there, there is a symmetry group G and uh, you can invent uh, new supplementary fields, which are all non uh, transformed non-trivially under some uh, symmetry group G and then you go back to branching one. Okay, so I already mentioned the energy momentum tensor many times. So that was Einstein's fundamental insight. So if I have a vector h mu nu, which changes my metric, g mu nu plus h mu nu, and you scale the h mu nu, then you get the, the energy momentum tensor as a functional derivative. Well, you don't get it yourself, you get an integral over it, of course, with a measure which is given by uh, the, the metric. So I can uh, recover the energy momentum tensor directly uh, from a boundary derivative in uh, the simplest possible boundaries, uh, just unit balls with metric G1 and, and G2, the, one of them can be the flat metric and corresponding volume elements. And uh, then, sorry, that, oh, that, there's a typo here. So ju just look at this thing, uh, uh, take this boundary derivative and uh, you get a multiple of uh, the energy momentum tensor at that point. Well, in, uh, the frame uh, you, you, have, you have specified. So uh, you can use boundary manifolds uh, which have the topology of a unit ball 
and in conformal field theories, the, the result, the, the fields which uh, come out uh, when you take combinations of that kind, uh, define the vacuum sector. I think that would be a useful definition for arbitrary Euclidean quantum field theories. So to get something new, you have to introduce boundary changing topologies. Now, um, the, the simple thing is uh, when here you, you, you only get one summand. And uh, when you, your theory is, is continuous, uh, then, uh, well, in the, in the affine case, you, you, one term uh, just gives you the identity. Um, and uh, that certainly happens uh, when uh, B has a topology of, of a unit ball, and you can define unitary theories uh, by the properties that it, it always happens. So if you change uh, your, your metric a little bit, uh, just even if you uh, connect uh, two, two disjoint components, and then uh, it, it doesn't do anything. Uh, however, uh, for non-unitary theories, uh, already the simplest topologically non-trivial uh, boundary gives you something new. So for the 2-5 minimal model, uh, take simplest way any torus uh, with one uh, boundary uh, uh, circle, and uh, then you will get a, an element of order minus to the fifth, uh, two fifths. So a rational number as order of the derivatives. And I will indicate uh, how that comes about. So uh, how, how do you actually calculate uh, this field? So let's go over to conformal field theory. Then uh, for conformal field theories in, in two dimensions, you have one additional act, axiom, uh, which tells you that the trace of the energy momentum tensor is a multiple of the curvature. And well, the number C is called the, the central charge. So, Here, uh, since uh, the trace of the energy momentum tensor, when you, when you go back to, to Einstein's definition, uh, then the, the, the trace uh, tells you what happens uh, when you rescale uh, the metric in, in this way, called the Weil transformation. And uh, so uh, starting from this formula, you can calculate uh, the effect of Weil transformation on the partition function. And the formula for that is here. So you, you, you just have the curvature, you, you have the, the rescaling factor, and uh, this gives you the quotient of the two uh, partition functions. So uh, in particular, when you have a, a genus zero manifold, uh, then uh, up to diffeomorphisms, everything is related mm -hmm. by Weil transformation. So once you know the number C, then you already know the partition function for all metric, uh, for all genus zero manifolds. And so you can take uh, the derivatives with respect to the metric, and so you get the, the endpoint functions for uh, genus zero of, of the energy momentum tensor. They, they come essentially for free, no new information. So, uh, there, there is one, uh, uh, the, the only uh, uh, constant is, uh, well, if, uh, how, how do you fix uh, the, the, sc uh, the scale of your partition function? For example, you can take uh, two unit circles and, and glue them together at the boundary and say the partition function for that is one. That's your choice. So next thing, uh, when you, you go higher, then, of, well, the whole uh, reparameterization of the manifold should not change Z. So you, you get a continuity equation for the energy momentum tensor. 
and uh, then, well, I assume many of you uh, have seen conformal field theory, but let me sketch nevertheless uh, what goes on to be on the safe side. You go in the tangent space, uh, you, you go to a complex basis. So derivatives respect uh, to the complex coordinates and its complex conjugate for a Hermitian metric. Every metric can be written in that form. So local coordinate, holomorphic coordinate Z, and uh, then the metric has that form. And uh, then uh, you can calculate uh, just uh, from uh, the formula we had before, from, from this formula, how the partition function and then also how its derivatives uh, uh, change under Weil transformation. And it turns out that uh, you can form a simple linear combination which is invariant under Weil transformations. And moreover, uh, this equation then uh, just tells you that uh, this combination here uh, is actually holomorphic. And of course, its complex conjugate is anti holomorphic. And uh, so, well, uh, when you apply that uh, to a partition function, then uh, when you apply uh, two of these derivatives to a partition function that points Z and, and W, then you get a function which is holomorphic as long as Z and, and W remain distinct. And uh, so you get a Leroy expansion. And uh, well, uh, diffeomorphism group uh, tells you exactly uh, what uh, the singular parts of this Leroy expansions are. And this is the, the famous Virasoro form. When you symmetrize it, uh, then you have here a fourth order pole multiplied by the central charge and the second order pole, which gives you the diffeomorphism algebra. And then the rest uh, in general will be new and uh, the zeros order term is, is called the normal ordered product. So uh, then you can ask, uh, in case uh, your theory well, uh, well, this this will be a new holomorphic field uh, by definition. So uh, just consider all the holomorphic fields of a theory, and uh, all of them have an expansion of that kind. And uh, so for them, uh, you have a normal ordered product. But uh, in fact, uh, the way the the axioms are set up. Uh, the existence of normal ordered products uh, is given by the axioms because uh, what, what you can do uh, when you, you have a, uh, two derivatives uh, given by a boundary, uh, you just, well, boundary manifolds, uh, you, you scale them and you plug them in into a single sphere. So, uh, in a way, you can take uh, derivatives of derivatives, or you can put uh, derivatives uh, together uh, just at different points, uh, well, in different regions of your boundary manifold. So, you always have something like an operator product, and uh, you, you can normalize that in, in, in a particular way as you like. But uh, for the, the holomorphic fields, of course, uh, this is a natural thing. Now, again, I have a, a bit of a problem of uh, terminology because, uh, well, there is the vertex operator algebra uh, community, which following Borges has its own way uh, to, to think about uh, these expansions. And uh, to, to write axioms for, the, uh, for them, which I find hopelessly complicated. Uh, the 
simple thing you can do is, is firstly, uh, well, it's what, what Samologikov had done when, when he first considered that structure. Uh, you take uh, the, the Fourier components, uh, just integrals uh, with z to the n, and uh, they, they algebra Samologikov called W algebra. And uh, it really would uh, deserve to be named uh, af after him. Now, uh, you, you get in particular uh, components which are invariant on the rotations, so uh, zero modes, and uh, their algebra, well, that's a zero mode algebra, which always has been used by, by physicists, but the vertex operator algebra community calls it uh, choose al algebra. Uh, I think that's a bit preposterous, on the other hand, uh, 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 I, I certainly need the name uh, to choose algebra for, for something else, which in a way is, is simpler. When you define an algebra uh, by this normal ordered product, which you can do for when you plug in arbitrary holomorphic fields. Firstly, the order is important uh, because, well, here's a W and uh, you, you can put in either a W or a Z and that, that changes thing by, by derivative. So you get an algebra uh, which is not commutative and it's not associative either. However, when you mod out uh, the ideal generated by derivatives, it, be uh, it becomes commutative and associative. And uh, so you have a simple, nice commutative associative algebra. And as far as I know, Chu was the first person to introduce that. So I will call that Chu's algebra. And when Chu's algebra is, is finite dimensional, then all the partition functions can be calculated explicitly by well-known algorithms, which you might program. Uh, they, they tend to get unwieldy uh, in slightly more complicated case, but in the very simplest case, well, a finite dimensional uh, algebra, where it's a graded algebra, uh, must of course be a nil algebra. So uh, the simplest case is an algebra which is just has one and uh, the Verasoro field, Verasoro field modulo derivative fields, and the simplest possible relation is t squared is zero. And uh, that's, that defines uh, the 2,5 uh, two minimal model. Well, it tells you that normal order, order product of two Verasoro fields is a derivative field. Uh, the only option, because it's created, is the second derivative of, of T. And you, you plug that in into the verasoro Laurent expansion. Uh, you ch uh, demand uh, that it doesn't depend on the choice of holomorphic coordinate z, and then you find out that that only works for if c is minus 22 over 5 and alpha is 3 tenths. And uh, now, uh, well, there's no time to present uh, concrete calculations, so I'll just uh, sketch it, what happens in, in the hyperelliptic case. So arbitrary genus, for genus 2, everything is hyperelliptic but for higher genus, uh, it's a choice. So uh, you want to define a partition function uh, on such a curve and uh, what uh, you, you, you want to choose a very simple metric. So a hyperelliptic curve is a cover of the, the complex plane. So I just, choose the flat metric and the complex plane, and I lift it uh, to the curve. That works except for ramifications point and, and infinity. So I choose some circles, no matter what, what radius, uh, doesn't really matter, uh, around infinity and around the ramification points. And within those, I, I choose also flat metric in the appropriate coordinates. So, then I have defined uh, my, my partition function. 
and uh, the only other thing which I can do is shifting the ramification points, and I do that by by action with just uh, a circle integral of the energy momentum tensor. So that expresses the change of the position function in terms of a one-point function. And uh, then I can change, uh, express the change of the one-point function by a two-point function. And uh, when choose algebra is finite and the class of the Virasoro field uh, is nilpotent, then the procedure will stop after a while and I get an ordinary differential equation for derivatives with respect to each ramification point. And uh, that's holomorphic part and same for the anti-holomorphic part. This means that Z factorizes locally into a finite sum of products of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic functions of the ramification point. And well, the, the way that comes about, uh, I think that ha has been discussed in a simple case by, by Ashok Reiner. Uh, the point is that uh, the normal order product uh, basically tells you what, what happens when, uh, the, when two points come together. Now, uh, when two points come together, firstly, you get singularities, but the singularities are known so uh, they, they can be subtracted. Uh, you end up with holomorphic functions or rather with holomorphic sections uh, in some line bundle. And uh, these holomorphic sections are determined by the values on the partial diagonals if n is large enough. And uh, for, for the two five minimal model where just t squared is, is zero, uh, that happens uh, when n is the, well, you, you get every second Fibonacci number. So uh, the way, the, the, the reason is uh, why uh, there are two Rogers and Romano chan functions. That means that uh, F2 is two. And when you want uh, to generalize it, for example, to G equal two, uh, then you get four, uh, which is, five, so you get fifth order ordinary differential equations and that hopefully will be recognized as the natural generalization of uh, Rogers Ramanujan uh, to genus two and so on. So uh, for G equals one, you find classical hypergeometric ODE with algebraic solutions. There are not so many of them. And at the end of the 19th century, Schwartz worked out uh, the whole list. And uh, in terms, uh, wh when you write them, not as function of the ramification points, but uh, of the, the modulus, then uh, you get this nice result, which I had at the beginning, and you, you get the rogers ramanujan modular function. That works for, for every uh, rational conformal field theory uh, for the the non-rational ones uh, one, one has to work harder and uh, there is still no uh, algorithm known which works in general otherwise you probably could classify all uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds uh, of, of dimension three and, and things like that. So as a conclusion there are axioms uh, which, for the partition function, which immediately provide you with most of the fields you need. Uh, and hopefully when, when you go to the whole uh, Tanaka uh, grind stuff, all the fields. And uh, in, in special cases like uh, free theories, and you can go to perturbations of, of free theories and uh, in particular for conformal field theories in, in two dimensions, uh, you immediately get mathematically very interesting results. Uh, in contrast uh, to vertex operator algebras, the important thing is that you never forget about the metric of your manifolds. 
And uh, so, well, there, there are three directions you, you, you can go. Uh, firstly, conformal field theories with parameters, then massive perturbations of conformal theories, and uh, conformally invariant theories uh, for d equals three, like uh, the three-dimensional Ising model, which has been much studied uh, in recent years. And, but I, well, as Danjo said at the beginning, I do too many things at once, so I didn't yet find uh, the time to look at that in, in any detail. At the end, uh, in, instead of giving references, uh, let me mention the, the people who did uh, work, uh, which was sort of the, the basic for, for all I did. Uh, that's uh, Graham Siegel's unpublished work on, on his way of defining conformal field theories and uh, then just using the partition function for arbitrary topology uh, had been mooted by, by Dan Friedan. And I said Ashok Greiner then uh, showed in, in simple cases how you get partition fun uh, f uh, how you can determine the, the partition function. And also, uh, uh, I had been impressed by uh, the first mention of a topology changing derivative I saw in the nature uh, in 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 the literature, which was by Stephen Hawking, when he said he doesn't like uh, uncharged scalar fields, they don't occur in nature and presumably they can't occur in nature because you, you could get some uh, uh, wormhole, a very small wormhole uh, linking arbitrary points of our universe at arbitrarily short distance, uh, the way you have it in, in science fiction movies. And uh, because uh, there's no angular momentum barrier for scalar particles, they, they easily might tunnel through and equalize uh, the scalar fields everywhere in the universe. So you only would get a cosmological constant. So that, that uh, got, me, uh, got me thinking along that way, though it was written up a long time ago. Well, that's all. Thank you, and please ask questions. Well, thank you very much for an inspiring talk. There are many questions. So if there are no questions, I'll ask the first one. How do you get back to real time? Oh, uh, well, uh, it's quite hard. Uh, I don't know how to, uh, to introduce something uh, for uh, a general Minkowski metric. Of course, uh, when you, you have a, a flat metric, uh, you know it better than, than I do. You need reflection positivity. Uh, you go to um, a flat torus. Uh, you do a wick rotation, and you take uh, the the limit of uh, infinite length. It's a somewhat involved procedure, and I very much would prefer to do things uh, immediately. Uh, in Minkowski space. Uh, I know that Klaus Fredenhagen has thought about how, how to do that, and uh, maybe he has some comment, but I, I, I can't really answer the question. Uh, Klaus or Jörg, do you have any comments? Yeah, uh, I think there are a lot of similarities in the Minkowski situation, but the main difference is that you have the error of time which is absent on the Euclidean space. And so I think you should not look at the partition function as a number because this cannot, uh, I think the number is more or less a matrix element of an operator. And uh, so, so I think one should uh, better consider the crucial objects to be operators, not, not numbers. 
Yeah, and then, but then I think you get a structure which is not so different. So, of course, the analysis is more complicated, but I think one can do something very un, uh, in a similar way. So for instance, this formula that the energy momentum tensor is a derivative with respect to the energy momentum tensor has a direct uh, uh, generalization to the Minkowskian situation. And uh, so I think one can do something, but maybe one has to be a little bit more abstract. So, so I have one question about the talk, and thank you for that talk. I'm not sure you could see the chat, so let me just unmute and speak up. Can you say more about how powerful you think your methods may be for non-rational conformal field theories, say in two dimensions? You indicated a couple of times that you think something should be possible by working harder, but you also acknowledge you don't expect to be able to classify all Kalapiao threefolds, for example. So uh, what do you expect to be able to do, roughly? Uh, yes. So, well, uh, to deform uh, within the space of uh, uh, conformally invariant theories, uh, you need a one-one field. So uh, the, the first theorem uh, you would need is uh, that a theory either is rational or it has uh, at least one field of uh, dimensions, one comma one. And uh, I don't know if, if such a theorem exists already, but uh, it, it should in a way and I could imagine uh, how, how to derive it, if it is true. And uh, then uh, one certainly could go over to Frobenius manifolds, uh, just uh, describing the mathematics of the marginal fields uh, in, a, in a similar way as I sketched uh, the, the mathematics of the holomorphic fields. I see. So that sounds like known mathematical results, but you get it in a nice way from your formalism. Is that an accurate summation? Yes, yes, yes. I see. Thank you. And similarly for the 3D Eisen critical point, do you expect some mathematical control analogous to what the bootstrap methods have already produced? Or uh, Probably, but I think it will be much harder. Uh, I heard that uh, is Singer worked on that problem uh, for many years and uh, at the end threw, threw away all his stuff uh, uh, because he, he despaired uh, about it. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's clear what's, what's much more, more difficult in, in three dimensions. In, in two dimensions, you, uh, the, your continuity equation uh, has has two components and apart uh, from uh, from the trace you have two components so uh, in a way the the space uh, of possible metrics is is very much constrained and in three dimensions uh, uh, it's not uh, you you have five components and only three equations so it it has to be much harder but uh, I, I still have some ideas how, how one might approach it. And uh, there are some things which, which came out uh, from the conformal bootstrap, uh, which, uh, so one field uh, which decouples. And uh, I certainly think that with the correct mathematical approach, uh, it, it should be easy to prove uh, that this field decouples. So, uh, in, a, in a way, the, the, the bootstrap uh, provides uh, very good guidelines, uh, but um, it, it uncovers uh, structures approximately, uh, which should be exact uh, results of, of the theory when, when you do it right. I see. Thank you. Uh, Balashandran has a question. I have two small questions. The first is that in all these things, when you are taking the act, the joining of two manifolds, looks very similar to connected sums of manifolds. I'm not wrong. Yep. 
Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, okay. Then the diffeomorphism group of these manifolds, and also when you take Kanitra sums, the mapping class group is very large in general and highly non abelian And the, the information on spin and statistics, according to Friedman and Sorkin, are in fact encoded, encoded in this mapping class group. So, the issue is how do you treat this if you want to access theorems of, say, Doppler, Hag, and Roberts, and so forth? Okay? The second question is when you have boundaries, the Laplacian is, requires has a lot of self adjoint extensions. Is it a preferred one? Dirichlet is only one of them, or Robin and so on. They are only very specific ones. Do the results depend on them? Yeah, uh, OK. Uh, firstly, uh, for, uh, for genus 1, of course, everything is still uh, very simple. Then, yeah. then you get SL2Z. And uh, then you get the theory of, of modular forms. So uh, for for genus two, I still don't co have not worked out uh, even the two five model uh, to its logical conclusion. Uh, one one gets a quotient of the mapping class group, but uh, I don't know yet uh, the the complete structure of the quotient. For example, I don't know if, if the result will, will be algebraic, so one only gets a finite cover. Uh, the first thing I did uh, was to look at Siegel modular forms, uh, which, uh, but it, it turns out that uh, the, the functions I get are ramified uh, at the locus of, of nodal curves. So uh, when uh, you, you pinch uh, your, your manifold, then you are still inside the Siegel upper half plane. So a Siegel modular form is, is just uh, holomorphic at, at that locus. But uh, for the 2 5 model, uh, because the dimension of, of the difference has a 5 in the denominator, you have to go to a five fold cover of uh, Siegel upper half place. Uh, so that's new uh, to mathematics as far as I know, but uh, should not be out of the world. So, uh, uh, of course, in, in general, as you say, uh, the, the mapping class group uh, is very large, so things could get arbitrarily complicated, uh, but uh, that does not mean that they will get arbitrarily complicated. You don't have any result on reflection positivity. Uh, well, uh, even the, the obvious theorem uh, that a theory uh, is unitary if and only if uh, all conformal dimensions are, are greater than zero uh, has not been proven. Uh, so uh, I, I assume it is true. There are certainly no, no counter examples, uh, but uh, as long as I I don't see a, a way uh, to prove that. I well, uh, okay. The 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 first thing is at the beginning. I uh, talked about uh, manifolds with, with a Riemannian metric, and uh, but I also could uh, impose an orientation that uh, the whole thing is uh, not invariant under orientation changing uh, diffeomorphisms. Uh, that of course has been studied, but uh, that goes uh, in the direction of uh, thinking about CPT. Now uh, for time, of course, uh, what Klaus Fredenhagen said implies in particular that um, CPT uh, takes on a different meaning in the Minkowski case, because uh, the, the, the T is special. So uh, I think in, in the Euclidean context, uh, the, the main question is about unitarity. And one would like uh, to prove uh, that for a unitary theory, uh, reflection positivity is automatic and, and vice versa. Beautiful talk. 
So are there any other questions? Uh, yes, I don't know if I am heard. Yes, you are here. Uh, oh, it's Christoph Gavensky. Oh, Christoph. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, hi. It, it's, it's maybe good that the scheme doesn't put at the beginning too much stress on unitarity. Uh, did you think about uh, sort of uh, extending it in the direction of gauge series, uh, just adding connections uh, as the background? Uh, 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 yes, uh, that, that certainly can be done. Um, I'm not sure if it has to be done. Um, it, it might be very interesting to do that. Uh, for example, uh, you, you could think about observables uh, localized on, uh, on sub-manifolds, which, which are not points. Uh, so uh, wh when you integrate a, a connection around a, a circle or so, that, that would be new information. So uh, it certainly should be done eventually, but I'm, I'm not yet thinking an, uh, along this direction. But you certainly could uh, uh, could clue in um, manifolds. Uh, well, you, you you take a circle, uh, you uh, cut out a tubular neighborhood of that circle, and uh, you clue in something else. Uh, that that would be a natural generalization, and uh, that would uh, immediately get you uh, to to connections. Are there other questions? Somebody is talking. Um, am I? Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. All right. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm looking at it. Uh, let's go mathematical. Uh, you're familiar with the Wilmore functional? No, unfortunately not. Oh, is the integral over a surface of the extrinsic uh, means curvature square. Okay, yes, okay. Wilmore invariant, and it comes up in uh, the physics of lipids. Well, I'm, I'm kind of curious if uh, some of your clearly high level research could be relevant because it applies to uh, the study of fluctuations. Where one can do experiments. I mean, there are uh, balls of uh, fat, basically. But they are the constituents of cells. So they're kind of important. And in that sense, the problem with the Wilmer functional that has been uh, quite popular in the math literature recently is, uh, well, one, it's a conformal invari invariant, and, but two, it involves higher derivative because the curvature is, so you got two, it's like an acceleration square. So I wonder if uh, uh, your axioms apply to higher derivatives. That's uh, yeah. eh? no CPT, no, no Hawking. Yeah, um, I thought a little bit about that. And uh, they, they might, uh, of course, if you write down axioms of that kind, uh, you, you have, have written them down for objects you know, like the conformal field theories, but then they automatically uh, take you into to other directions uh, when uh, you you look at general systems which which satisfy them. And uh, already the the almost trivial case of of one dimension. Uh, showed uh, the, the possibility of having more than one cosmological constant. Of course, one of the, the a simple invariant would be the appropriate uh, function of the volume, 
Right. And uh, that, uh, so I automatically get quantum field theory plus cosmological constant. But the cosmological constant is, is just a basically trivial thing. But uh, there, there might be more uh, when, uh, when you think about them uh, really uh, without, uh, just from a mathematical way and uh, without being uh, too much constrained from your previous experience with quantum field theories. Thank you. Um, Werner, in your framework, do you see any obstruction to high dimensions? Uh, the only one is in, in the six dimensional theory, uh, a scale invariant six dimension theory. Uh, I'm not sure, and actually, I'm almost sure that it cannot be incorporated. Uh, there, there may not be a Riemannian metric uh, which you can change. And uh, so, uh, that that really might be a, a new structure. Uh, of course, once it is understood, it, it probably uh, could be included in, in some kind of, of generalization. But uh, what what happens in, in six dimensions really seems to be different. But uh, in, in the four dimensional case, uh, Eventually, it, it might be necessary to, to put in logarithms that, that I don't know yet. Um, uh, certainly, when you want to do logarithmic uh, conformal theory in, in two dimensions, then one should put in logarithms. Um, but I have not seen a logarithmic quant uh, conformal field theory defined on, on arbitrary uh, two-dimensional manifolds, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure about that. But otherwise, uh, so uh, as I said, the, the, the next uh, obvious step uh, would be to go to three dimensions where uh, I'm sure uh, that, that everything will work out, but uh, well, has to be done first. Well, you, you, you went from two to three dimensions as a first step, so I, I mean, you know all about that. <laughs> well, we look forward, Werner, to your coming back again to telling us about three dimensions and more. So thank you really for a beautiful talk. And uh, Donjoy, maybe you have some concluding remark. Thank you. No, it's a pleasure to, uh, to have Werner as one of our colleagues and to thank him for such a nice talk. Thank you. So bye-bye, see you next week. Bye-bye, bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.